Um, so I'm Danny Cole from Newcastle University. Um, I just wanted to emphasize that the uh, sort of funding in my group doesn't come directly from Open Force Field or any of the industry partners. I'm funded by uh, UK uh, Research and Innovation. Um, but as I hope you'll see during this talk, the interactions that we've had with Open Force Field over the last three years or so um, have been really valuable for us in terms of scaling up what we can do with our methods uh, to larger data sets or improving our own sort of software skills and mindsets. Um, and hopefully it's been a bit useful for Open Force Field as well in terms of bringing in some of the ideas that we have in our group into your own uh, fitting efforts. Um, so we've already had a talk from Josh Horton this morning and pretty much all of the work that I'll show in this talk is work done by him uh, in collaboration with many of you uh, and other members of my group. Uh, but he's let me uh, share it with you today. So just a brief introduction uh, about the sort of work that we're interested in doing in my group. Um, as you'll all be aware, molecular interactions and dynamics would be ideally described by quantum mechanics. Uh, but of course, this is too expensive for routine use. So most of what we do can be broken down into these goals of firstly developing better approximations to quantum mechanical modeling, uh, usually in the form of molecular mechanics force fields. Um, as we're increasingly trying to do with uh, advice from a lot of you, is producing software to automate this process and getting it out so that people can use it. And it was really gratifying to see talks from uh, Cresset and Excientio in the last few days uh, where they've started to use the software that I'll talk about. Uh, and as well as that, as Joel mentioned as well, the importance of collecting and analyzing data so that we can all build on each other's work. Um, and the, the sort of uh, applications that we have in mind, like many of you, is to try to deliver more accurate predictions for computer-aided drug design. So with that in mind, I'll, I'll start by talking about a particular software project uh, that's been mentioned a few times in the workshop so far, and that's the Open Force Field Bespoke Fit uh, package developed by Josh and others. Um, so as we all know, the accurate determination of molecular conformation is absolutely crucial, particularly in structure-based drug design. Um, and in particular, the confirmation is sort of largely uh, determined by torsional rotation about flexible uh, bonds, such as the one that's rotating in the little movie there. Um, and unlike bond and angle parameters, transferability is really difficult with torsion parameters, um, particularly because they tend to be very sensitive to their surrounding environment. So what tends to happen with force field design, uh, as we see for the OPLS3 versions here, is that the torsion parameter library can sort of explode as you try to um, uh, describe more and more of chemical space. Whereas, of course, we all know that due to uh, sort of clever chemical perception, the open force field library uh, is much smaller, uh, but that can still lead to deficiencies in uh, the description of torsional scans. And that's sort of uh, exemplified by the graph in the bottom right here. So we've got a QM plot of a torsion scan for this molecule in blue. And if we do that same scan with either the open force field in red, I think, or the gas in green, uh, we get both the wrong minimum uh, position and the wrong relative energies of neighboring minima. So the open force field bespoke fit package aims to uh, fix this problem by fitting bespoke torsion parameters for the molecule under study. Uh, and we've seen in the previous talks how that is done. Um, we want to provide this robust molecule specific parameterization workflow. So the molecule comes in on the left hand side of this flow chart. Um, the, the flexible torsions are automatically selected. Uh, and we use uh, vivo bond orders to uh, fragment the uh, molecule uh, into chemically sensible uh, uh, fragments that are as 
small as possible whilst maintaining the chemical environment of the torsion. Uh, uniquely, we have these very bespoke smirx patterns, which uniquely describe the chemical fragment under study. And once we have that, the fragment, we can do we can collect the reference data, which is usually a quantum mechanical torsion scan of uh, the torsion under study, and use force balance to optimize the MN parameters to match the QM. Um, and so in the on the graph on the bottom right, obviously we see what happens. The the uh, the bespoke bit curve is now matching pretty much exactly the quantum mechanical curve, as you might expect. And again, fairly uniquely, uh, we haven't seen it before in other in other codes. This uh, is uh, very well interfaced with data uh, storage uh, archives like QC archive. But for those of you in the pharmaceutical industry, that can also be a private uh, repo. Um, and we can use uh, data with repositories like this to generate uh, parameters at scale. And we've done that in the JCIM paper that's linked at the bottom there. Uh, so I showed you one example of improving uh, the description of the quantum potential energy surface. Uh, but just to show you some more statistics on that. Um, so if we look at the open force field, parsley force field, uh, for example, at the top here, what I show here are two measures of how well we're replicating the quantum mechanical potential energy surface. So don't worry too much about what these mean, but the RMSD is basically how close the MM structures are to the QM structures over that scan. And the RMSE basically gives a measure of the match to the potential energy surface. So this is quite typical for transferable force fields on the top. And at the bottom, the bespoke fit curves are improving both the geometry and the energetics of the scans. Um, and additionally to that, through the interface to this very nice QC engine software, um, we have uh, sort of uh, access to a whole range of other reference data generation options. So not only can we change the level of QM theory, we can use completely different reference data. So I've shown here a few examples uh, where we are, for example, using the XTB semi-empirical method to perform the scan and then quantum mechanical single points on that potential energy surface. We can also do XTB scans with any uh, single points or just pure XTB scans. And what's quite nice is we get this sort of ladder of accuracy and of course that's also a ladder of computational expense so if you don't mind the accuracy so much you could use xtb to speed things up a bit and as i mentioned at the beginning we're not just interested in reproducing quantum mechanics we want that to be more accurate and useful when we go to using that and for example protein ligand binding free energy calculations and that's exactly what we see uh, in this tick two example. So on the left hand side, the parsley, parsley open force field does quite well already for this system with good correlation with experiments and RMSEs of about 0.7 kcals per mole. After refitting all of the torsion parameters for this full congeneric series, the RMSE comes down to 0 0.5 kcals per mole, and we again see very good correlation with experimental data here. So just looking to the future, and again, I, I'm happy to see that others are already doing this. I would very much like this to be sort of implemented as a routine tool for free energy calculations. So anytime we set off 100 free energy calculations overnight, to make predictions for our drug discovery efforts. Can we have a loop in here where we're automatically uh, parameterizing these torsion parameters in a bespoke manner? Um, and uh, I'm also gratified to see uh, that Tobias has been trying this out as well in uh, crystallography simulations, which we haven't spoken about yet at, at this workshop. But bespoke fit again is, is, is showing encouraging improvements compared to the base force field. In these, in these cases. And I'm sure there are many more applications out there as well. Just give my voice a break for a second, sorry.
Your volume is really good. Is it good? <laughs> That's so far. <laughs> oh, good. I might take it down a bit. <laughs> um, Right, so that's uh, bespoke parameterization uh, for torsion parameters. Um, but a lot of the work in my lab is also trying to bespoke the whole force field, if you like. So can we bring in a molecule that we want to uh, derive force field parameters for and derive all of the force field parameters in a bespoke manner, again, from quantum mechanics? So uh, this, the coming slides are a bit of a mix of old work. So we sort of started this in 2016 when I was in Bill Jorgensen's lab. Um, and some of it is kind of future work, a bit sort of speculative and things. So excuse the mix of data. But this slide sort of shows the overall approach. We're very keen on atoms in molecule electron density partition. So this sort of separates us out a little bit from the work that's done in open force field, where you tend to use more sort of uh, AM1 BCC or ESP uh, charge fitting methods. Uh, atoms and molecule electron density partitioning has a few um, advantages, in my opinion. For example, it doesn't suffer from the buried atoms issue um, for, uh, for large molecules. Um, so just to talk you through the approach here, so on the left hand side is a sort of cartoon of a molecular electron density. Um, so you can use a whole range of atoms and molecule partitioning methods to take that total electron density and split it up amongst the constituent atoms in the molecule. Uh, so MBIS and DDEC are two approaches that we like, for example. And it's quite simple, you try to assign as spherical an electron density as possible to the atom. So these atoms at the top in, oh, sorry, these electrons at the top in red here are assigned to this hydrogen atom, and the electrons in green here are assigned to the carbon. We can then calculate atomic properties of those atoms. So the atomic charge, for example, is just taken by integrating up the atomic electron density and subtracting it from the nuclear charge. We can also calculate something that's similar to an atomic volume by integrating up the R cubed moment of the electron density. What we then want to do is to discover QM to MM mapping protocols to map these atomic observables onto force field parameters. Uh, so atomic charges are the easiest. We've already calculated them, it's these things. So those are the atomic charges. I'll show you in a second how to get off-site charges using this approach. And we're playing around a lot still with converting these atomic volumes into something that look like Leonard Jones type parameters. Um, and just as a side note, all of these electron densities are computed in an implicit solvent. Uh, so as to effectively account for these uh, induction effects in the condensed phase. So just a slide on offsite charges. I've, I've, I've been speaking to, about these uh, with open force field for a couple of years now. So, um, so what we do to get offsite charge, so take this molecule, for example, shown here. Uh, the oxygen, as many of you will be aware, um, doesn't have a sort of isotropic electron density around it. It would have areas of strong negative charge uh, in the areas of the uh, lone pairs on the oxygen, shown there by the QM uh, sort of color scheme. Here. Of course, if you try to assign an MM atom centered point charge to that atom, you will get an isotropic electrostatic charge. Of course, it doesn't match the QM. Um, so now that we have an atomic electron density, we can calculate from that an atomic electrostatic potential. Um, and what we do is we can move around the positions and the charges of the virtual sites on the atom so as to mimic, uh, so as to match the QM electrostatic potential as closely as possible with the NM charge. And we see in this case that with the addition of just two virtual sites onto that atom, that we get a very good match between the QM and the MM sites. 
And just to note that to limit the search space, we maintain the symmetry of the actual responding environment when searching for these positions. So, um, the difficult part is always the Leonard Jones parameters. So there's no a sort of clear um, target, sort of quantum mechanical target when we're trying to assign Leonard Jones parameters to an atom. And that's because it's got to account for all of these things like short range exchange repulsion as atoms get too close together, as well as longer range dispersion interactions. Um, so the best sort of data source that we found is quite a small data source, but it's a really nice paper by these people uh, on the shown at the bottom here. I recommend reading it uh, if you get a chance. Um, and what they do is they build a force field for a set of small molecules using a very physically motivated uh, model, the Slater model, which is based on the overlap of atomic electron density. Um, so this is a functional form of it, so it's very complex, so it's more complex than we want to use in open force field type efforts, but at least it gives us something to, to aim for. Um, so, and they do derive full force fields for these molecules, and they combine it with an accurate uh, multipole and uh, polarizable charge model, and they get very good results in the condensed frames as well, so it's always right. Um, uh, it is very expensive to run. It's also very expensive to parameterize. They use high quality DFT SAT uh, energies, as well as atoms and molecule analysis to break it down into atomic contributions, which is again useful for our purposes. But what, what that does allow us to do is it allows us to compare um, sort of uh, sage type potential energy surfaces with these Slater type models. So on the right hand side, if you compare just the thick line with basically any of the thin lines, uh, the thick line shows that complex Slater model. And on the top is an oxygen map, uh, atom in acetone, where we're comparing the Leonard Jones part of SAGE with the kind of non electrostatic part of the Slater. So in the top case, we get a very good match with the highly accurate SAT DMT type data. Whereas on the bottom, uh, that uh, for the same molecule acetone for one of the carbon atoms, we get a very poor match between the force field type models and the uh, Slater model. Uh, so that might be, for example, an area where we could improve uh, the force field. Um, but we can also use this when we're thinking about um, mapping from uh, QM observables uh, onto MM parameters. So in the bottom left-hand plot here, I've taken a load of plots like the ones on the right, and I've extracted the effective sigma parameter. So I've just looked to see where the minimum in the potential energy surface is. So that's what's plotted on the y-axis. This is the sort of optimal sigma parameter, the best sigma parameter we can come up with given what we know about quantum effects. And on the x-axis here, uh, we've tried to fit a QM to MM mapping model to map the atoms in molecule volumes, which I showed you a few slides ago, onto, uh, onto these accurate sigma parameters. So there's a few variable uh, parameters in here, which we can tune to get as straight a line as possible. And with those tuning parameters, I hope you can see we can get a decent correlation between the best sigma parameters and those that we can model from quite cheap quantum mechanical model. So these are expensive, these are cheap, but we can map these ones onto these. Sorry, one more break. So that part I just told you about was um, uh, part of, sort of what we're working on right now. And the sort of toolkit we use for working on these sorts of things is a software package, uh, which Josh and Chris Ringrose have put together called QKit. Um, so I, again, this has been around for a few years. I don't really see this as an alternative or competitor to open force field, 
I see this now as our sort of playground for playing around with force field hypotheses and feeding those into open force field type initiatives. Um, so the way this works is that molecule comes in at the top, uh, we perform a few sort of optimizations and things, uh, and then we try to use our bespoke parameterization workflows to, to output the support field file. Uh, so we've got the torsion drives, which Josh has now been working on since the start of his PhD. Um, we've got Hessian calculations, which allow us to get bond and angle parameters from the modified seminario method, which many of you will be familiar with. And we can do these density calculations from which we can calculate non bonded parameters, as I've been showing. So, out of this comes a force field file, and we can interface with force balance, an open force field evaluator, um, such that any sort of tunable parameters that are left in this model can be rapidly tuned against uh, experimental data. So we had a publication a year ago uh, where we did a lot of this based on heat, heat of vaporization. We now have a new interface with Simon's open, open course of evaluator code, where we'd like to expand the training and test sets and train against more properties. Um, so I don't have a good picture for this yet, but basically we've uh, got to put together a new training set which contains 26 binary densities, 26 entities you can see, and around a similar size test set. So this could be trained in a couple of days, so we can very rapidly make force field hypotheses, train them up, test them in a couple of days, throw them away, or bring them through to you guys to, uh, to uh, extend. Uh, this is for HCNO only, um, and let's get that. So here are some initial tests. Um, actually, not all of this is just around atoms and molecule. We can do some SAGE testing as well. Um, so in the case of SAGE, we use that train and test set to train a new set of transferable sigmas and epsilons uh, for SAGE-style force field. Um, so I'll go through those first. So those are these first two columns. So we've trained a SAGE model with a tip 3 p water model. And we trained a SAGE model with a tip 4 p force balance water model. So this sort of investigation comes into, I think, something Shapin will talk about when fitting protein force fields. Everyone's interested in new water models and so forth. Uh, but actually, in our hands, the training and test data here for these two different water models uh, are quite similar. Um, I should note that we didn't co optimize the water model here. If we did, I think the 4P what model would probably come down lower in that. Um, we've also, we can now also compare directly our QB type atoms in molecule analyses directly with open force field models in an apples to apples kind of way, which we haven't done much of before. So we can use exactly the same uh, charge model uh, and just uh, and then we refit the Leonard Jones type models that I told you. And in that case, we get similar accuracy, a bit worse than the SAGE type models with fewer fitting parameters. Uh, and we have some new mapping ideas which we can put in here yet to be done for the virtual sites in yet. So there's some more improvements to come. Um, but let's say that QB becomes a little bit more accurate than SAGE here. The question is, so what? You can parameterize these in a second. These ones, you have to do a full QM calculation. So this will never be uh, competitive with these. But the answer comes in John's previous talk, um, where we can use the types of graph neural networks that we spoke about to uh, rapidly assign these, uh, these uh, quantum mechanical observables for new molecules if we're able to train them up. Uh, so as we've seen here, we can use these graph neural networks to provide continuous atom embeddings uh, to describe non-bonded parameters. So John talks about using that for charge fitting and, and parameterization. Um, but in the current Espaloma model, for example, 
there was there's still at some typing in the form of Leonard Jones practices. So what we're proposing is if we can if we can extract these continuous type of Leonard Jones parameters from quantum mechanical observables, then we can also train up an Espeloma type model um, to uh, uh, to predict those atomic volumes and hence Leonard Jones parameters in a continuous type way. So we can get rid of the action types altogether. Um, so I'll, I'll show you a few results where we've used uh, Simon's data set of 50,000 molecules uh, computed at the Hartree Fox 61 PD level, um, as well as the ESPs on these molecules. Simon kindly stored for us also the QM, the actions of molecule charges and volumes, which allow us to train up these uh, Espeloma type models. Uh, so in our hands, uh, for our atoms and molecule charges, we find our MSE of around 0.02 electrons on the entire data set. And I've just shown a couple of examples of a good match where we get extremely good agreement between the predicted uh, atoms and molecule charges and the reference QM data. Uh, and a slightly worse one, which we need to look out for if we're going to use these for uh, parameterizing a whole set of molecules. And as I say, this is something we put together a year or so ago. We haven't put it out there anything yet. We're, we're still working on improving the model. Uh, but as I say, we can use our QM to MM mapping uh, force fields to derive a consistent non bonded force model that's completely described by these graph neural network atom embeddings. So there are no atom types here at all. Um, and we can do these liquid properties. So in this case, we can look at density and heat to vaporization with very uh, uh, with similar accuracy compared to uh, sage type force fields with these problems. Um, and we're looking at now at extending those benchmarks into mixture properties and free energy benchmarks, as well as improving these models. Uh, okay, um, I'll do that very quickly. If there are any free energy type people in the model in the audience. Feel free to talk about, to us about our FE Grow software, which is our little contribution to free energy calculations. It's very useful for setting up a congeneric series of ligands in a binding pocket using all your latest and even machine learning potentials for doing the optimization. Uh, following on from Dennis's talk this morning as well, we, did, we also work a lot with Gavin Charlie's uh, group at uh, deriving fast and accurate linear atomic cluster expansion force fields from quantum data. We published something last year that was very consistent with Annie in terms of either the timings and or the accuracy. And do watch the space in the next few months, we will have a transferable version of this force field, which will be, could be used in exactly the same way as Annie, very smooth, differentiable, and so forth. Okay, I hadn't actually finished that slide when I sent it to Jeff, so I'll uh, skip over that one, take questions. And uh, yeah, so just to thank uh, Josh in particular again and the rest of my group and everyone who's opened the force field, uh, particularly Simon, who we've done a lot of work with, and Jeff and team for really integrating Josh in particular into the whole software infrastructure. It's really valuable. Thank you very much. <laughs>